An angel is traditionally regarded as a spiritual being believed to act as an intermediary between humans and a higher power, often associated with benevolent guidance, protection, and support. In various religions and cultural beliefs, angels are seen as messengers of divine will, tasked with assisting and watching over individuals of specific groups. Amanda Coleman, known as the Irish Angel, has created one of the world's most respected support networks for law enforcement, first responders, and the military. Her dedication and guidance have made a lasting impact on the lives of those she's assisted, transcending typical notions of support. Amanda Coleman embodies this role, serving as an angelic figure sent to provide assistance and support to those in need. Welcome to this special episode of Gold Shields with the Irish Angel. Gold Shields brings true stories from law enforcement, the military, true crime authors, and first responders. Experience the dedication, danger, and emotional toll with the heroes themselves. These gripping tales of true crimes, true stories, and true heroes are all here on Gold Shields. Hey, we're back. This is Dan Murphy, along with my partner in crime, Tom Smith. And we're very excited about our guest today, Tom. Who do we have? And we're so lucky to have her. Finally, after like over a year, uh, just to give everyone a little background on Amanda Coleman and Irish Angel. When we started this show a little over a year ago, Amanda and Irish Angel was the first organization to reach out to us, to want to be involved in, in Gold Shields and loved what we were doing and the prospect of, of the show and the guests we were having. Amanda just latched on. And thankfully, I mean, because she is a godsend with just being a dear friend, uh, but what Irish Angel is all about. And it's all awareness of PTSD, uh, anxiety, depression, suicidal tendencies in law enforcement, fire department, the military, and she is all over it. So everybody, welcome to Gold Shields, the Irish angel, Amanda Coleman. Amanda, thank you, and it's about damn time. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. It's only been a year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you're a, you're a hard gal to nail down. You travel quite a bit. You're all over I the place uh, spreading the good word about the work that you do, and it's a work that's near and dear to your heart, and we respect it that is. and admire that so much. Um, tell us a little bit quickly, um, not quickly, we, we're going to get into Irish Angel, but first things first, I think uh, something that's going on in uh, on the outside, as they say, that has been bothering a lot of people, and it should be, has been something you've talked with us about privately, and we'd like to share with our audience. And it's not just limited to Ireland. It's, it's, it's a problem throughout a lot of Europe, isn't it, uh, is the illegal alien issue. Or, the, or maybe they're not illegal over there. Maybe the country's letting them in, but I don't know. You'd have to, yeah. Tell us what's going on in your hometown of Dublin and beyond, Amanda. Um, well, so first of all, just to give everybody a rough, clear estimation of the size of Ireland, it's probably about six hours top to bottom and about three hours east to west. So it's a tiny little island, probably not even the size of one of your states. So you have to remember the capacity of, of the island, right? And a lot of it is rural areas. So it's countryside. It's all um, farming areas. Apart from Dublin, Dublin's like living in Manhattan. So it's got the highest population but it's the second smallest county in the country um going back this is this has been kind of an ongoing process i have seen since 2015 um it was something you guys were it was only kind of coming into fruition around that time but it hadn't hit america yet which was the whole globalist organization thing the wef um, sadly, our leader is one of the leaders that is involved in that. He was one of the young influencers of the WEF. So therefore, his policies are very much that of what's going on in Europe right now. And actual fact, Ireland and Canada and uh, Australia, we are the poster child for the WEF as is right now. So it's not necessarily just the um, immigration thing. It's It's a collective, a whole bunch of collective things that is destroying our country. 
But um, needless to say, when the Ukraine war happened, we were going to take in 200,000 Ukrainians, families, like, which was fine. They're fleeing war-torn countries. That's fine. And listen, Ireland is a country of migrants. We migrated everywhere because we were a very poor country. And then gone back about 20, 30, 25 years ago, I'd say now, we joined the EU and all of a sudden we have all these NGOs, we have all of these global organizations coming in. So the country's very wealthy. GDP is very is up, up a lot, but the people are not wealthy. It's far from that. So we're experiencing what you guys are experiencing with inflation and all that kind of stuff with the Manhattan prices in Dublin. So um, bearing that in mind um, with the Ukrainians, it was one thing bringing those people in and, and they needed to be there. Having said that, we had, at the time, we had 14 and a half thousand Irish homeless on the streets and 4,000 uh, 4, of those are children. Um, some were in hotels and some were in tents. I have passed last St. Patrick's Day when I was in Ireland, I went uh, to the kids to pray, walked up. Oh, sorry, it wasn't a parade. We went to one of the protests. Sorry, it wasn't. The Irish flags were sitting on my head. Um, we went to one of the protests there and I went, walked up to get my ride home and there was a tent with a clothes horse, you know, like what you dry your clothes on and it had like kids' clothes on it and a tent, a family-sized tent outside of, of uh, the government buildings. It, it's just horrific. So what happened was not only with the Ukrainians, they were building modular homes for the Ukrainians whilst the Irish is on the streets. Then, all of a sudden, in the last year, what you've had happen in the last three years in America with migrants, the whole migrant situation, we have had happen in one year. And it is not the best of people, to be fair. And that's not to say there's not good people that come from their countries. There is. But these are all military age men. And they're from Somalia, Algeria, Albania. Our crime rate has gone through the roof. And as I'm sure many of you guys know, Irish police officers don't carry guns. We have stab proof vests. We don't have bulletproof vests. This is for our beat officers now. We do have special units and they've stepped up the units. But the problem is we now have this massive migration uh, into the country. And um, what's happening is our Irish people, one, the kids, they can't afford to live there, right? So they, one, they can't afford to live there and two, it's got too dangerous. So all of the youth are emigrating now. They're all moving out of Ireland. So we have this massive influx of all of these people coming into the country because our government went on national TV about 18 months ago and told the world, if you come to Ireland undocumented, you will get automatic asylum. So they were jumping on planes, flying over to Ireland, getting rid of their passport when they got off the plane and coming through customs. And this is how it all happened. So needless to say, the crime rate's gone through the roof. We have had two gay guys beheaded. We have had a woman's throat slashed 11 times. We have had a guy go down and take a machete to a kid's kindergarten school on Thanksgiving um, and stab three children, one on life support and, um, and the teacher. And like, I mean, that's just to name a few. It's just off the chain now. I'm terrified of my daughter's going into the city. But the issue that we have now is a lot of our police officers have retired from, from the police force because morale is so low. They got a new commissioner a couple of years ago in 2019 and suddenly it's taken a turn for the worst, unfortunately. And um, new policies are being brought in and they can't hold police officers. So the situation is right now that the government is now opening up our law enforcement agencies and our military to these migrants for them to join the forces. And they are. It's starting to slowly trickle in and um, things is not looking too bright for Ireland right now. Um, but the Irish people are resilient. We've always been the fighting Irish. And there is a movement right now in Ireland where people are standing up. And as, and as are the farmers because they're trying to shut down our farms as well. So or will do the farms, the farmers out of business. They're trying to tax them so much that they can't with all these new regulations for, you know, for um, climate change, all this nonsense. 
um, that they basically can't afford to stay open and they want to kill 200,000 of our cattle over the next three years, which is insane. So um, Ireland is on fire right now. And um, I don't envy our police officers that's left in the force because they have orders to do um, and they're going to the protests. In fairness, I have been at our protests our protests are not like the protests here. They're actually really nice. We had one one riot where the city went crazy was when those three children were stopped. Um, the people wanted to send a clear message to the government that they were not going to take it. Um, so, but other than that, we go, we hold up traffic for about an hour. People say their speeches, they sing songs and everybody goes home. Um, so the police now have been brought down to these rural towns, which is, it's not good. I've seen plenty of videos going around where the police have been brought down to rural towns where there is, say, a community of a hundred people and they're shipping down in bus loads, these migrants, and you're talking about 150 per, per little town. And that is outdoing, obviously, the population of that town, which in, in the countryside, it's more so elderly or young f or families. And so they're afraid to go out after dark. But the, I think what's happening is the police are being put in such a position and I don't envy their job right now because they believe there's, there's good ones there that believe the same as what we do. But they have a, you, you guys know better than anybody, they have a job to do. Um, and I just feel like they're caught between a rock and a hard place right now, you know. So, yeah, Ireland is a mess. Hey. <laughs> Absolute mess right now. Yep, you know, and and... and... I spoke to you probably about a month ago on the phone and you literally broke my heart because you were born there, you were raised there, and you see your country getting destroyed, as is what's going on here. And the reason Dan and I just talked before we started the show about the opening of the show and the reason we started it off on this note with the, the immigration problem that, that Ireland is going through, because people listening to the show and watching us, it is not just in the United States. This is a worldwide problem. And when you have an, an island off the coast of the mainland that is being infiltrated to this extent of crime, homelessness, and all that, what's going on with landlocked places that they're just walking in as is here? This is a worldwide issue, and this is not going to get better anytime soon unless people wake up and start taking care of their citizens, whichever country it is, here or in Ireland. And it's, Agreed. it's heartbreaking. Agreed. Um, I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. But there's one thing I can say about Ireland right now. I don't know if you guys knew the government, again, with this whole woke agenda thing, I don't really want to get into too much of it, but they, on Na International Women's Day, they tried to, they did a referendum where they wanted to remove the word woman, mother, and family from the constitution. And needless to say, the Irish pe people's voices were heard. We sent a clear message to the government that that was not the case. So now the Irish people are pushing for referendums and general elections because we need to get these people out that we could take control of our country again. Because with this mass exodus of our youth, we have no more Irish citizens going to be born in that country. Not to the extent that there should be, because I don't care what country anybody comes from. Two things. You should never have someone outdo your nationality, ever. You should always control that, right? Because there's one thing that I love to do when I go on vacation, is if I'm going to a different country, I want to experience their culture. I want to experience what the people are like figure out, you know, it's, it's something different than what you are used to, what you're accustomed to. It's something that you want to educate yourself on and what you want to experience, right? These are all life experiences. But now what's happening is you have this mass influx of people and the exodus of the Irish people. There is no more culture. Our culture is dying. We are holding on for dear life with our culture. And Ireland is an ancient country. We are ancient. We are uh, the country of scholars and, and, and writers and musicians and everything. And it's just, to see it just diminished, it's just, it, it's sad. You know, I, I don't have any words for it. Like, it actually upsets me. 
You know, I yeah. think it's Ireland is a microcosm of what's happening in the United States. Uh, it's it's smaller and more intense because, and there's benefits to having like the United States is obviously geographically much much larger than Ireland. And as a result, if 10 million people stream across the border as they have under our current uh, quote unquote president. You have uh, a country that in certain ways can absorb it without the majority of the population really feeling it. Unless you live in a city that's a sanctuary city that has raised the flag and instead we'll take them, which is they don't want them. <laughs> it's funny. We watch what happened in New York, et cetera. But for the most part, the average person's life hasn't been impacted that greatly. But in Ireland, as you said, six hours and, you know, it's not on a super highway. This is, this is a much smaller place. It's, it's more congested. Everybody feels it. And there are, th there are three things that I heard somebody say once, and it really struck with me. Three things that make a country. You need borders, you need language, and you need culture. And those are the three unique things to every country. Well, we've given up a part of our southern border, and now being an election year, we want to get it back, of course. Too late. Sorry. Uh, language, there's always been a push to make English not the official language of the United States. The English tried to destroy the Irish culture for how many, 800 years? Take, taking the language, trying to destroy the culture, trying to su suppress the religion. Everything they did, they, they could do, and they made no bones about it. They wanted to crush the culture, but the Irish culture has remained. Uh, I've heard the Irish people called bent but not broken. Uh, they've been, everybody's come into Ireland and tried to destroy them, everybody. Yeah, we've and, been colonized for years. Mm -hmm. For years, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and for our heroes, just like the Americans in, in 70 and 76, um, for our, it, our night, well, sorry, um, yes, yeah, 70 and 76, right? Yes, yeah. 70 and 76. I do you know what's going through my head, um, Yellowstone, <laughs> <It's just laughs> the fairy thing. oh my God, I'm having a blonde moment. Anyway, she. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so um, our heroes, they did the same as, as you guys. Um, in actual fact, many of the Irish fought in their rebel revolutions here. But uh, in, in Ireland, we, we fought hard for our freedoms. And we were a country that didn't have weapons. We didn't have anything. We begged, steal, and borrowed. And, and in actual fact, we got help from the states to claim our country back. Um, and we did it. We fought like hell for our country. And over time... They did a great job of indoctrinating the youth, indoctrinating a lot of the, I guess, it's really, str it's really st strange for me to think of this. The more I analyze it and the more I talk to people, the more educated you are, the more dumbed down you get with regards to what the government has given you. The more, the, you know, and you, if you question everything and you do your research, you will learn so much more. You're more open to things, but these people are very close to things. So there is a majority of Irish people that still are living with their head in the bubble, like, in, you know, and I don't blame them because of what they did to us. Like they, they did it through media. They did it through everything, just like what they're doing in the States, as I said, but in, in the States, the difference is love it or hate it. You have two sides of an argument right now. We have one. And that is it, period. All of, uh, like, even Sinn Féin, which is a political party in Ireland, that was the party of the IRA. When they downed, downed their weapons, they started this political party. And even they now are on the left. Like, and I don't mean just the left. You're talking about the extreme left, right? The, it, it's insane. They're all wearing their, their World Economic Forum pins. They, that's what they're representing. They're pushing that whole 2030 agenda in Ireland. And to think, you know, that we are going to give away our sovereignty and have our heroes torn in their grave makes me sick to my stomach. Like, I can't even tell you how, how bad it makes me feel. Um, because we are the fighting Irish. We've always fought for our country. We've always had to. We have to fight for our place in society everywhere, even even when we migrated to America years and years and years ago and famines and all that kind of stuff. And, and even before that, we were slaves in America, you know, and we were very much, uh, we, we were taught the same as black people, as was the Italians and everybody else. But the Irish, we were, uh, we were a low, low grade below that, like we were. But we built our, our way, we fought for our place in society. 
you know, it's what we did. It's what we do. We just were resilient in that way. And now I'm just seeing how, how you see a culture completely flip 180. Um, and now see that you, when it, how would you say it? It's like when it's too late, people wake up and now it's too late. You have people going, oh my God, this is actually happening. And people are doing their research and more people are coming out now, you know, more people are getting involved and rightly so. But we don't know what to do. We're at a crossroads because the government has set up a way that you can't take on any more political parties into our doll, which is our parliament. You can't take them in there anymore. So they have to go on the EU stage. So they're, they did a great job of securing their, their agenda within, within the parliament. So I don't know what's going to happen. Um, all we can do is keep fighting, keep voting for the independence. I'm hoping with the referendum, only 40% of the country came out. And I think it was like sort of like 70, just below 70, no, just below 72%, I think, voted no, no on the referendum. So that in itself, that was just a referendum. It wasn't an actual vote. So if, if the actual vote goes ahead, I can see the Irish people rising up and um, and taking, trying to take our land back again because we have a fight in our hands. We really do. We really do. So you mentioned the World Economic Forum and the whole concept of globalism, which in my, you know, layman's estimation as a non-politician, but as somebody who watches world events and has studied a thing or two, is vastly destructive to any sovereign nation, any sovereign nation that is developed, that has its own economy, has its own culture. It's, it's going to devastate. And we had President Barack Obama, who was all about globalism. We all the world, hold hands, share what we have, spread it around, give it to everybody, let everybody in. Uh, there are powers to be that are pushing this agenda globally. Uh, it's big money. It's a lot of things. And none of it benefits the average person in a developed country. None of it. No. Matter- you know, you're right. You hit the nail on the head. It's none of it. It's the only people that's going to benefit from this is the people that's involved in that forum. Nobody else. The, the people with money will. The people who are middle class or lower class, not at all. Not at all. The concept of globalism is actually discussed in the Bible, not to get too uh, Bible thumping at the moment, but in, in Revelation, there's um, mentions about how globalism is one of the signs of, of the end of days. Uh, mass world leader will emerge. Um, and this is what it seems like it's going towards. It, you know, it, it is. I think we're living in biblical times. I, I, I you know, the, and it's so, it's so funny, you know, I've ha- lived a life of trauma. And through having trauma, sometimes you question your faith. It's not necessarily that you question your faith. You you question everything, right? Um, part of my PTS is I'm an overthinker, so I analyze, overanalyze everything. Um, and to a fault, <laughs> to a fault. Every worst case scenario, I can run it through my head, right? Um, but, you know, when you're analyzing all of this that's going on and, and you're seeing the hatred that there is for human life, human existence and and cultures and just countries as a whole from these people makes you question the evil in this world. And it's brought me closer to, to God myself. And that's being honest, I'm not a Bible from Burrito, but at the same time, I have my faith. Don't believe in the constant. I don't believe in the institution anymore, but I believe in my faith. And I think we all have to have a bit of faith right now because I genuinely do believe that we are living in biblical times. I think the Bible, the more I read about it, the more I'm going, oh my God, this is like, this This is it. It's happening. Like, there's no if and foots about it. It is happening. And these globalists, they will not stop. Their agenda is laid out there on the World Economic Forum's website for everybody to see. It used to be called Agenda 21, and now it's called Agenda 2030. Their plan is out there. You can go online and read it. They will paint it out to be a resilient cities and this, that, and the other, and it's great for the environment. Is it hell, right? You will own nothing and be happy is their motto. And their motto is to get rid of our farming communities, rely on insects, and I know it sounds far-fetched, but it's up there. You can go read it. Um, insects and lab-grown meat that we don't need to be polluting the environment with our cows and all this kind of stuff. Um, 
and that um, we will rent everything that we own. We won't own anything. Everything will be rented. And we will live in resilient, resilient cities, of which they are building right now in Dublin. 15-minute cities, which means we can't leave a radius of our home of 15 minutes once these are built. Um, and that means that uh, we will no longer use cars, you know, or won't be polluting the environment. Um, and the digital currency is coming in that's linked to your health and your expenditure and your carbon footprint. That will also penalize you if you step out of line, basically. It's all a control thing. And I do, I genuinely believe that the Bible was right, that there is an antichrist out there and it's coming. It's coming for us big time, big so time. I, I was amazed when I heard about the 250,000 cows that the yes. Irish government had agreed to kill because yes. apparently they fart. I mean, here's oh, news. Heaven here's forbid, news. Like... Cows fart. But here's the right. other thing. I'll put up with some cow farts if I can get a good ribeye. I mean, I'll, exactly. I'll, take, I'll, I'll take the cow farts and the ribeye any day of the week over some I'm lab with you. I meat. I love me with me. I only eat beef, pork, and chicken. That's all I eat. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you know, the funny thing about it is the world has been around for centuries, right? Uh, and or for thousands of years. And we've had dinosaurs. We have had animals way bigger than cows that fart. <laughs> and you can't tell me they were blue in the ozone there. <laughs> you know, so like it's just again, it's indoctrination. The science speaks for itself. The more that this is going on, there's more scientists out there that are actually speaking out about this. And it's fascinating to watch, but you will not see it. That this is the thing that really bothers me because these big companies like BlackRock, Vanguard, all that kind of stuff, they have. They have a seat at every boardroom table at every media company. So they control the narrative. So what gets out there, you're only hearing one side of it. You have to go down that rabbit hole. And I genuinely think, yes, there's the whole the whole thing with TikTok, right? Um, but having said that, I think there's other it's not just about what they say they're shutting it down for. I think they are shutting it down because there's too much truth that's getting out there on it. People are posting stuff in real time. People in America wouldn't even know what's going on in Europe, only the, only for TikTok. They've seen all the protests with the farmers right across France, Germany, Ireland, England, everywhere. Like, And not just out in, out in hundreds, they're out in thousands, if not millions, you know, and, and people are rising up, but they're suppressing that. And why are they suppressing that? That's the question. You know, it's it's crazy. They want to control everything that we see and everything that we hear, because if they can control that narrative, people will live in that bubble and continue to live in that bubble, you know, and they have people where they want them. But you'll have clever people like us to actually do the research, watch what's going on, question everything. That's what you have to do now. We live in the most messed up times. I never in my in my 48 years on this planet, I have never experienced anything like I have in the last two years, three years since COVID. You know, it's insane. We're going to continue to pray for, for Ireland. This, uh, Thank you. just sits in our heart. And uh, we're going to continue to pray for our own country that all this gets straight bad at some point, somewhere. Yeah. Uh, America's our last hope. We're fighting for you. Next was... election. We need, we need we all need the help you. we can get. We need uh, <laughs> what we want to get into now is your nothing less than a calling in life. And that's what it is. You know, you got called to assist and bring awareness in law enforcement community, first responders, the military of this horrible thing going on, the stigma of, of PTS and, and anxiety and depression that is all over all three of those organizations and it's heartbreaking because Danny and I know people who have committed suicide. We know even more people who are depressed, uh, all from the job. So let's get into Irish Angel. Your your calling, why it started, how it start, and and what you're what you're presently doing, Amanda, because it's amazing. I mean what you do is absolutely a blessing and amazing. So let's hear it from Thanks. you. <laughs> Um, I started it. Uh, I started it back in 2015. Well, I didn't start Irish Angel. It wasn't Irish Angel that then. It was just kind of me posting messages of support. 
when I saw what was happening in America and the war on police officers. Um, and I, again, as I said, I, I've had a lifetime of trauma since I was a child all the way up to probably about 17 years ago. And so I am, um, and I also grew up in an environment around alcohol and prescription meds use and all that kind of stuff. And it wasn't the easiest of a life, that's for sure. But then again, every one of us has, <laughs> right? We all do. Everybody does. And nobody, you as you hit on a point there, like, Nobody is exempt from feeling bad or having depression or anxiety or whatever. We're all human beings. It doesn't matter whether you wear a badge or whatever. We're all human beings. So we suffer, right? It's how we manage it and how we process stuff that matters. But um, yeah, so when I saw what was happening in America, I just talked to LinkedIn, posted messages of support, not even thinking it would get anywhere and uh, that it would even make it to America. <laughs> And um, two weeks in, I was inundated with messages of support for police officers and, and agencies thanking me for what I was doing. And um, a SWAT team in Virginia, a HRT Ocon one team, gave me an honorary call sign, which was Irish Angel. I am not pretentious enough to give myself that name, just so <laughs> everybody knows. That was not of my doing. <laughs> that was of a great gentleman, Stephen Brooke, through Virginia. Awesome guy. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, because someone did something like that for me, I've never had anything like that done for me in my life. Like I haven't. And that got me right in the field. Even to this day, it does. And um, so I started a website that was username and password for people to go on. It was a safe haven for them to talk um, and their families. And uh, when I was doing that, we were sharing stories, funny stories, sad stories, you know, families were talking. It was like an open forum. We'd post news articles. We'd post, a bit like what we do now on, on, on our LinkedIn page. But we'd post, we'd post stuff and people would get more interactive, right? Because before then I wasn't, I wasn't a nonprofit. So we could talk about things that was, you know, that you could talk about. And I was watching the conversations back and forth with the families. And as I was watching it, it was triggering stuff within me. And um, it made me realize just how much our protectors think they're protecting their loved ones when they're not. And I've been that loved one, right? So I understood it. So I, I, I got passionate about it and I started to do some research on suicides. Obviously, I knew it was there in the veteran community, but I didn't realize just how bad it was starting to evolve within the first responder community. Um, and a very good friend of mine is the sheriff in Schenectady, New York. Dominic D'Agostino, he calls me, he's like, Angel, you've got all this following, what do you want to do? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I said, I can't do anything, I'm not in Ireland. I said, I'm not in America. I said, I'm in Ireland. I said, but I I, I know I have a passion, to, I, I want to help. And he says, well, you're not American, he said, but I am, and I believe in you, he said. So I am going to start a nonprofit. it's going to be your baby, and you're going to run it. So I was like blown away by this again, not used to somebody doing something like that for me. So I saved all my money up, flew over to the States in January 2019, did some research, figuring out how best we could help people. Um, and the consensus was that people who are in crisis mentally can't always afford travel expenses if they're going out of state for treatment, which nine times out of ten they're sent for out of state. Um, so they... Um, we knew we had to start there, but we were hit with everything. Like, I can't tell you, like, obviously we were hit with COVID. As soon as we got our 501, I was cancelled off LinkedIn. I was one of the first cancel cultures, lost all our following. Um, so that was gone. Um, literally the week we got our 501. Um, and then what happened? Oh, COVID hit then when we were launched in Boston. Then wokeism happened because we were going to do some online um, fundraising. That happened. We were we were uh, auctioning off sports memorabilia that no one would buy because they didn't support our, our law enforcement. So it was back to the drawing board for us. And, um, you know, thankfully, I partnered with some amazing people and um, we, we got some fantastic resources available um, to be able to help people. So if people reach out to us for help. We can get help to them within 24 hours in the U anywhere in the U.S. Um, and, and we're blessed for that. We've even had someone within 20 minutes. So um, 
you know, and then based on assessment, then they're sent to whatever treatment facility, whether it's inpatient, outpatient, whatever, that best suits their needs. Um, yeah, and then we go around police departments and fire departments educating on wellness and resiliency. Um, so that just to give them some education, you know, that they can take take away with them. And all of our team, apart from me, is has been in service or, or still is in service um, and has some in some way suffered with PTS addiction or had suicide in their family. So everyone in Irish Angel, um, no one takes a wage. No, not not me, not anybody. Um, we all do it because it's close to our hearts. It means the world to all of us. So, you know, um, I'm I'm blessed to have the people that surround me because they lift me up every day and I lift them up. And, uh, you know, they're great people. But I, I am just, I'm very proud and honoured to be able to do what I do here and to be accepted into something like the law enforcement and the first responder community. Because it is a huge thing for an American to be accepted into that family and here to have an outsider little old me it's like come on in it's it's the best feeling in the world don't play truly are my family you guys too well thank thank you for that and um funny thing about cops and first responders in general we have very keen senses of of detecting bs when when somebody's a phony we know it it comes from a career of dealing with people you you figure out who is genuine and sincere and who is not and the sincerity comes out of you. It's just so obvious that your heart is in this. And, and we are the kind of people, Tom and I will tell you this, and we've said it all the time. If we sense that you're a person who has a good heart and is you know, looking to do the right thing in this world, we will go to the wall for you. We will go to battle for you. We will do whatever. In, in anything you can imagine, we would make happen because we want to do good things for good people. It's that simple. And we're very, very honored and proud to know you now because the work you do is so incredibly important. I just got done reading Kevin Donaldson's book. I read it in two days. Um, man, you were crazy. And he does give a shout out to Irish Angela there. And I know you He's know awesome. Kevin. Uh, I do. We, we, we love Kevin. And I can't tell you, it couldn't, couldn't have been written, um, him and his partner, Chris, who wrote the book together, couldn't have been written by two better people. The firsthand stories, the, um, the statistics and facts and, and surveys and things that they, they intertwine in the book are so relevant. If you have a cop in your family, if you are a cop, if you were a cop, if you want to be a cop, you should read this book because it'll help you understand the pressures and stresses, the unique ones that go on in the world of law enforcement and the impact it has on people. And Kevin, I, I salute you all day long for your, for your courage, your honesty, your candor, your ability to get up and say, this is the way it is. And that's it. You got a problem with it? You're just not admitting your own problems. But if you do that work, you're going to have some issues. So thank you so much for what you do, man. I can't even begin to thank you enough. No, you're welcome. There's no need to thank me. It's it's really funny, like, falling into this. Like, I mean, I think I was saying to you before, as a hairdresser, I knew nothing about the nonprofit world. And it's like you said, I guess I went in very vulnerable thinking, you know, everybody who has a nonprofit is very much like me, that they're doing things out of their heart. But it's not always that way, right? And you, you, you get... I got burned a couple of times, but you know what? It doesn't matter how many times I got burned. You keep getting back up and you keep fighting. But the more people that you help, the more it helps you. So if you if you pay it forward, if you keep being kind as kind as you can to people, because you never know who's struggling, right? It doesn't matter what profession you're in, whatever. It it really doesn't matter if you. If you care about people, just be kind to people. You never know whose life you're changing. Just by giving them your smile. Like, you know, I know that sounds cheesy, but honest to God, it's the truth. You never know who needs your help. And just because someone may have money or someone you think someone has a great life, we can all plaster all over social media how good our lives are and everything else. In reality, ask yourself, are you really happy? You know, there's, there's so many of us out there that's not, that's suffering. And suffering in silence. And silence is not the way to do it. Like, if you have a friend, talk to a friend. If you have someone, a colleague that you're right or die, go talk to them. They're not going to judge you, you know. And um, if the truth be known, by you talking to them about your shit, they'll start opening up about theirs, you know, because that's how it happens. Having difficult conversations with each other. 
that's what it's all about. We need to have that open door policy for our friends and our loved ones to be able to talk and be a little bit more understanding with each other. You know, I think that's the fundamental key is everybody's got problems. Just be kind to one another. Right. You know? And you know what? These days, you know, organizations like yours are so treasured because back when Dan and I started our careers, there was none of this. You didn't talk about it. You didn't mention it. God forbid, because your career was was off the tracks, you were done. You were going to have your gun and shield taken away and put on a desk in the middle of nowhere doing midnights. And that was going to be it. So, you know, it's so, we're so thankful for organizations like yours and others that have come about, you know, with this horrible post-traumatic stress and, and depression that's out there. My question to you that I was just thinking while you're talking, are you seeing... Are you seeing a decline since you started? Is this getting better in any on any level? I think it is. I think, I think, right. So here's the thing. I think the issue is with leadership, right? There's a lot more being done centered around wellness right now, but there's a, still a lot of chiefs and sheriffs out there or from all departments right, across the board. Um, yes, they want to be seen to do well, wellness stuff within their agencies, but it's just checking a box. It's not actually being proactive and, and physically helping these people, you know. Um, there is a lot of agencies out there. The majority of them are doing great stuff. There's a lot of them doing like Chief Neil Gang out there in California. Unreal. I went out to his department. They have it, the little resilient Zen room. You can go in when decompress if you've been at, at a critical incident or whatever. Like, I mean, that's being hands on. You're being hands on. You're having psychologists to hand. You're working with, with you know, organizations to be able to bring education around wellness to your departments. The more education you have for your people, the more they'll understand that this is okay to not feel okay, you know. Um, but they need to be more proactive. Stop checking a box and get out and do your damn job and look after your people because, we have all of these massive budgets, right, for for organizations, for agencies, for equipment. You have it for their uniforms. You have it for their cars. You have it for their training. But you're not fixing the biggest tool that a person has, and that's their brain. If you're not looking after their brain, what's what good is the rest here? Your your officer is not at a hundred percent, and if your officer is not at a hundred percent, how the hell is he doing his job, right? And, and then he's just absorbing everything else. And the problem is, as you guys both know, you see enough enough every single day and experience enough every single day. And it's not necessarily just what you see on the job. It's a lot to do with, you may have childhood trauma you've never dealt with, but what you see on the job is attributing to how you're feeling, right? So this is, you're like an onion. You keep layering all of these layers on top of you, on top of you. And before long, you're just going to explode, like, you know? Um, you can't, you can't contain all of that. So I, you, no one knows when it's going to hit, but it will hit, like, you know, and I, I, I think the leadership has to do something. Stop checking the box. Get out there, be more proactive in your, in your department and, and be more real with your people. Get your boots, get your ass out from behind your desk. Go out into the cars, go out with your people, show them you're there to support them. You know, let, experience, I think as well, and I'm I'm not have, just having digs at leadership, but I think people who are in leadership, there's a lot of people who will sit behind a desk for years and not know what it's like to experience modern day because they're off the street so long to experience modern day BS that's on the street that's affecting your officers. You need to get out and understand your officers, understand what they're going through and know how you can help them. Help them be a better officer, which will make your agency more better. It's simple, you know, it's logic. Very well said. And, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's always been the case that uh, people who, who spend too much time in administration, leadership type stuff, they're not out in the street. That's always been the case. When I think of the past few years, what we've seen since COVID and all the other stuff that's happened in America and beyond, we see even more of a greater need for leaders to be on the street in front of and with the rank and file on a regular basis. Let them see that you care. Another point, though, you talk about budgets and finance and how much it costs. Now, any police leaders listening right now, if you haven't considered this, and 
police leadership has come a long way in America. There are great organizations and lots of training and, you know, God bless them. They've come a long way and there's some great leaders. But think of the business case. There's a business case to be had for putting money into wellness programs, real wellness programs, without strings attached, without negative repercussions for careers, um, real wellness programs. Because if you think about a damaged brain, and I'm not talking somebody, you know, I don't mean that facetiously. I mean, somebody who has massive amounts of trauma collected in the brain that's interfering with their ability to have joy in their life, peace in their heart, um, deal with their reality. Then you have an individual who's going to be going to look for ways to alleviate some of that pain. It's going to be drugs, drinking, alcohol, you know, um, whatever it's going to be, it's going to be negative. And that person comes to work a broken person. And they're dealing with people who are broken. And their reactions are not going to be those of somebody who is of sound mind. They're going to be, they're going to be getting complaints, civilian complaints. They may be getting in, in physical confrontations that are unnecessary. They may be uh, getting in trouble, uh, arrested or indicted for crimes because they're, they're acting out. Not to mention the lawsuits that are going to come for that, or even just the massive amounts of sick time that can come in from somebody who's dealing with things and doesn't know how to deal with it. Well, I can't quit to work today because I've been drinking for 12 hours, so I'll stay at home. These are all financial costs. Workers' comp claims, everything can add up. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and I think there's a business case to be made for making an investment in these sorts of programs. I agree 100%. I, I, you, you, you never said a truer word, um, you know, and, and people don't look at it from that point of view, and they so should, because it's costing in the long run, you know, um, it really is. And then as well as that, even when you think about it, how badly stretched departments are right now for manpower, if you're if you're that badly stretched and you have somebody who's suffering and they're taking time off, I mean, you're going to get annoyed at it and they're going to pay the price, you know, and then you're down an officer as well. So you you you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. You know, you owe it to your people. You owe it to your department and you owe it to yourself. Like consciously, I mean, I, I, me as a leader, maybe I'm just too soft, but I could never be a police officer anyway. <laughs> but I mean, um, I'm too soft with the respect of uh, caring too much. You know, you can still care and be a, be a, a good chief. And a, in actual fact, it'll probably make you a better one to be more um, open with your people and, and the rest will follow. Because if you're good with your people, they'll be good to you. It's as simple as that. And if you're helping them mentally, it's a win-win. Your your company is doing great. You're financially stable. The person's got a job. Everyone is happy. You know, you're doing your job to the best of your ability and you've got a good department under your belt. I look at, again, using Neil Gang's um, uh, department. It's fantastic. Like, it's fantastic. And um, there's so many others out there that are doing it too, but there's just not enough. We need, I'm not saying people have to be airy fairy all about resiliency and everything else, but at the end of the day, we need to let them know that there is out for them. There is, it's okay to do that stuff. You know, it's, it's part of life. If you want to live the, your best life, you have to look after your mental health, period. No matter who you are, you have to look after your mental health. And it took me my journey through Irish Angel to figure that out. I was a hot mess. I had no cl clue what ending me was up like. <laughs> you know, and I still don't someday. <laughs> Welcome to the human race. Yeah. yeah. Right? But I mean, I was, I was a cluster. Like, <laughs> like now I'm, now I'm, I, I'm okay. I can look at myself in the mirror and think I'm okay. And, and Dan, to your point, like everybody finds an error. If it's so, here's the thing, right? You can either have an out with doing resilience stuff to help build your wellness and your awareness and everything else, or you can take the out that is sex, drugs, alcohol, food, you name it. A food was mine. I mean, I was a hundred pounds heavier, right? Because I would eat my emotion, and and people people do everybody does the same. They either get one extreme, they either bulimic or anorexic. Or, or they're overweight, like, and it's all down to this. You know, we all have to choose better choices. We all have the same choices in life. It's just a matter of breaking the cycle and choosing to live 
you know, you have to choose to live. And and that's what I did. And now I'm here and, and like, you know, I may not have much, but I've got heart and I can look at myself in the mirror every day and think, you're all right, <laughs> you know, you're okay. You're not much of a, as much of a cluster as you used to be, but you're still a cluster. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, and you know what? We say it all the time, you know, and, and you just said it. If your mind is not okay, nothing's going to work. You could be the most physically fit person in the world. If your mind is not fit, especially for the job, you know, on, on any level, like first responder, the military, whatever, you could be a physical specimen. And if your head is not in the right spot, nothing's going to work and you're going to fail and you're going to, you know, and it's not going to be pretty. Uh, so not to tell a secret, but you're in the United States now. Uh, what do you got going in the U.S.? Um, we've been over here, we've been teaching some classes like around the country about wellness and resiliency. Um, and then on the downtime, I stay, I actually stay with my friends in South Carolina and do my work from there, um, which is great because then I can just kind of potter around and go to where I need to go to. Um, but right now, um, we're in, I'm in Savannah, as I said, this is, we've been invited down by the Emerald Society. Again, it's about raising awareness and hopefully now we're coming down here to do some classes as well. With uh, we've met with some of the sheriffs and, and chiefs here. So um, that's going to be happening now in the next couple of months as well in May, I think May to your time. So, and, there's a, uh, and there's a slim chance we'll be at that small gathering on Sunday in Savannah. And on Saturday. But, well, it's um, Saturday. They I'll, won't have it on Sunday. That's right. That's right. No, they have it on Saturday. Um, I will. I'm in the parade um, on, with the Emerald Society on, on, uh, on Saturday. So I'm looking forward to that. It'll be great fun. It's uh, I haven't been in a parade since the New York parade with the Port Authority Police in 2019. So it's going to be good. Be good fun. Going to be great. Yes. yes, yes. Say that in my head on Saturday That's morning. Right. morning. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you're going to be uh, a couple of states away next week. Is that right? You have a, something right. you want to That's right. I'll be in Dallas because I know the, I know someone. That is a going to be in the Hall of Fame, Chief who, Hall of who Fame. Who could that be, man? Oh, I wonder. I wonder. <laughs> not, not looking at anybody in particular, like. Got to go support my friend. I love you. I'm so proud of you. I can't even tell you. I'm so proud of you. To see you guys come. I remember when you started and, and myself and Tom got to talking. And uh, I was like, I got to, I got to introduce you to people and see from that moment on it was so it was so strange right to watch you guys evolve i i get joy out of helping people right so i remember when you started and i was like putting you do you remember i was emailing people and, and linking you in right but watching you like within two weeks you were like this you had interviews left, right, and center with everybody. I'm like, they're on it. This is going to be such a success because your passion and your drive for to do what you're doing has just been nonstop. You guys are like a freight train. Exactly. <laughs> and it's been fantastic. And to watch you evolve, I'm kind of nervous, like, because I, I remember watching you guys from the beginning and you could tell you were new to it. Now it's like, it's just a walk in the park. And I'm thinking of starting a podcast now. And I only had this discussion with Tom the other day. I'm like, I'm so nervous of it. <laughs> I'm very doing it. I'm going to be a hot mess. <laughs> no, no, no. You're great. Well, we, can, we can tell you how much we have appreciated your friendship and your support. And uh, we look so forward to next week seeing you in, in, in Fort Worth. Yeah, and, me um, too. I can't wait. It's going to be a can't blast. Wait. See, we first blast. time meet you, Dan. Yes, yes. Well, the flesh. Most people run screaming, but you're actually going to stay in the room. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> so you can practice your Irish brogue with me. That's what you can do. I know. won't be doing that. Is there no reason for that, no. Just a wee bit of it, perhaps. Just a little. Just a little, yeah. It's all good fun. Ah, good fun. Except stay away from the moots. The moots. You won't be hanging around with the moots. Plenty of moots, I tell you. There's plenty of moots around. A lot of them. <laughs> oh, my God. That's funny. Uh, you're you're a riot. We could talk to you all day, man. Thank you so oh, much. I love you guys. Yeah. If I, uh, please, God, go forward. I'm going to be reaching out to you guys for help when I start this podcast. Oh so, yeah, uh, yeah. You can you can coach me. Just saying. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Between you and Kevin, you guys and Kevin and and so for podcast, I mean, I'll be, I'll be on race. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you think Kevin, about right. you think about what you did. You know, you Dan, you just talked about our relationship with Kevin Donaldson, the Suffering Podcast. That was Amanda. Amanda yep. hit me and Kevin up and said, you two idiots need to talk to each other now. <laughs> and and more on A meet more on B. And yeah. that's what it was. I, lo- it's... I loved I loved the so, Suffering so Podcast. Oh, they're, they're so great. Kevin is such a dear friend and Mike and you know, they're they're great. They're awesome. They're such a a, a positive force, you know. Yes, tremendous um, people. Mm-hmm. And you guys are right there with them. So I love you guys to pieces. And um I wish you every success. With one, your product, and two, your your podcast, because you you guys are nailing it. It's Thank awesome. you so very much. You're uh, everywhere. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I see you all over social media. <laughs> Thank you so very much, Dan. What do you think? Amazing, amazing. I just love it, man. They're just uh, what a. It's always a, a privilege, and today was fantastic. So this is a great segue into next week. Uh, we'll have much to talk about when we see each other in person, but thank you for sharing who you are, what's going on, your observations about, about things in Ireland and, and, and how they compare to America from a crime and, and social, uh, just health of the country, uh, situation. We see the same things in America and it's sad to see it everywhere, but also for who you are, what you do with Irish Angel, the lives you touched and will touch. And we are blessed to have you in our, in our world. Thank you. Thank you. One hundred percent. Well, like we do at the end of this show with a little, little added uh, information because of Amanda being on today. Uh, IrishAngel.org. Go to their website. You need help. There's two numbers on there. All right. The help number is 800-273-8255. Or you could text BLUE to 741741. And we'll have that on our posts when the show is up, uh, all that information for everyone. Reach out if you need to talk to someone and you need help. There's no one better than Amanda out there to help, and her team are all in for it. And uh, perfect time of this show to pray for all our law enforcement officers that are out there dealing with the worst things on the earth. And it's a blessing to have them in our world and in our life to protect us all the time between the military and our law enforcement friends. So say hello, give them a wave, pat them on the back when you see them in the store, and always keep them in your prayers. Uh, Like always, our little selfish plug, uh, youtube.com slash at Gold Shields, and thegoldshieldshow.com is our website. Check it out. Support us. Hit that bell. Hit the subscribe button, all that good stuff. Uh, For the Irish Angel and the love of our life, honestly, uh, we love her. Everything she does on a personal level and professional level. Amanda, thank you so much for being here. My partner, Dan Murphy, who I couldn't do this without. Uh, This is Tom Smith for Gold Shields. Everyone stay safe. See everybody soon.